I would like to thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to present uh, this seminar today. And uh, as I've been introduced by Paolo, I'm going to talk about the CRISPR-Cas system and, there, and its function not only for uh, in the detection of microbial nucleic acid, which is going to be the last part of my talk, but also a little bit about uh, another uh, issue where selectivity and specificity is at the heart of the function, which is the gene editing. So as we all know, the CRISPR-Cas system is a nucleic acid-based adaptive immune response, which has been evolved by bacteria and archaea to protect from viral infection. So when a foreign DNA by bacteriophages is introduced in the bacterial cells, it is uh, uh, inserted in the CRISPR locus and then the is helps generating a CRISPR uh, RNA, which will eventually prevent further infection because it's going to recognize and cleave the foreign DNA. So beside the origin of uh, the function of the CRISPR system, in latest years, this has attracted uh, much interest in uh, several biotechnology research fields. And, uh, especially where selectivity and specificity is the key which is requested, such as gene editing and biosensing. So I've decided to divide my talk into parts. The first one is going to uh, talk about uh, the use of a CRISPR-Cas system, and in this case I'm going to mention as an effector protein Cas9 to perform gene editing. And I'm going to show you an example by talking a little bit about a fungal pathogen that, as Paolo has mentioned before, has been uh, the topic of my research for, for many, many years. And as an organism, as a model organism, I'm going to talk about candida orthopsilosis and the inactivation of an entire gene family. In the second part of the talk, I'm going to briefly go towards uh, the use of a CRISPR-Cas system uh, as a versatile biosensing tool. And in this case, I'm going to focus uh, as an effector protein on Cas12. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction on the CRISPR-Cas based sensor and then I'm going to talk about uh, a project that uh, has been developed uh, in, latest, in the latest in the last couple of years let's say in our laboratory to set up a system exploiting the Cas12 collateral activity for bacterial DNA detection. So let's move on to the first part. Uh, when we mention fungal pathogens and candida species we everybody immediately thinks about candida albicans because it's a common and uh, is the most frequently isolated but in recent years non-albican species have gained much attention and this is especially due to the fact that most of them are developing uh, drug resistant phenotypes and this is worrisome. So among these candida parapsilosis is one of the most commonly isolated I think is second third uh, most frequently isolated after candida albicans and is frequently associated with uh, premature newborns, so candida parapsilosis infections are very common in neonatal intensive care units, but we can find uh, these species in neutropathic patients in all those subjects which are, are associated with uh, uh, catheters or plastic prosthetic devices, implants or patients that are undergoing intravenous hyperalimentation. Candida parapsilosis belongs to a complex uh, that so-called candida parapsilosis species complex, uh, which encompasses three species, candida parapsilosis, ortho, and metapsilosis. And in our lab, we have been long interested in these species, especially candida parapsilosis and orthopsilosis, because they share very similar virulence features and pathogenic potential, both in vitro and in vivo studies. studies. So we have uh, started uh, um, characterizing virulence factor of these species and in the last 10 years we mainly used uh, gene deletion uh, strategies which as many of you may know can be quite tricky especially when you're working with a diploid microorganisms. So the, we, are, we are very happy to see uh, the CRISPR-Cas system published but this happened quite late consider the system that are available for example for bacteria. In 2015, Valnick Vias and Gerald Fink at the MIT developed the first 
CRISPR Cas system for the gene editing of candida species. It was set up for candida albicans, and as you can see in this graph, um, it, it is a, the first one was an integrative strategy. So basically, you had a cassette which had Cas9, you see here. Um, a codon optimized version of Cas9 because Candida albicans as well as Candida parapsilosis have a peculiar codon usage. They belong to the so-called CTG clade, which means that they translate the CTG codon in serine instead of leucine. So that requires, of course, uh, an optimization and the creation of a synthetic gene. Then we have the flip as a recognition targets. And inside this cassette, you have the flipase enzymes, which is uh, under the control of inducible promoter. Then you have a resistant marker for the tracing, and then the single guide RNA, which is the one that is going to drive uh, the, the activity of Cas9. So this was really good because in a single round of transformation, it was uh, possible to target contextually both alleles of the gene that you want to inactivate, it was possible to perform gene editing, and it, they, uh, Vias uh, and co-workers also demonstrated that it was possible to inactivate genes belonging to a, a gene family. Mm -hmm. they, they demonstrated that with CDR genes, uh, and by, that is a, a very little uh, gene family because it encompasses only two genes, but they, they as a proof of concept, they demonstrated that was possible. As a downside, Mainly, the, the issue was that Cas9 remained in the genome of the edited strain. And this is not nice, especially under a strong promoter like the one driving the system of Vino1 in Olase. So this is what was not ideal. But two years later, Lisa Lombardi, who was a former PhD in my group and moved to Dublin, uh, devised uh, an episomal strategy. And she set up the system for candida parapsilosis. And this was much better because uh, in this plasmid that is called PSAT1 ribo that you see here, we have an autonomous replication sequence in East. We have a selection for candida, the nursutricin, again, under the control of a strong promoter. We have the codon optimized version of Cas9. But what I want to draw your attention to is the ribozyme cassette. Basically, this cassette that you see here, is, uh, whose expression is under the control of, of the RNA2 polymerase promoter, uh, transcribed, transcribes uh, the guide RNA, which is in between two ribozymes. Now, the, H uh, the hammerhead and the HIV ribozyme, as soon as I, they are transcribed, they have uh, a self-cleavage activity which releases the guide RNA in the nucleus, which is then able to complex with uh, Cas9 and drive Cas9 to the desired target when it operates the double strand break. And if you co-transform with the repair template for the homo homologous uh, repair for the homologous recombination, you then have a genetic strain that bears your desired mutation, that could be an insertion of stop codons if you want to inactivate of a different codon, a restriction site, a barcode, whatever you want to insert. So, as I mentioned earlier, we were really interested in virulence factors of uh, uh, candida species. And one of the the factor we were more most interested in is the uh, ability of the yeast cell to adhere to human surfaces. And in Candida albicans, we know that one of the most important adhesin is encoded by a gene family, which is called a glutenin-like sequence. Now, this gene family encodes for eight ALS proteins that you see depicted here in this picture, as uh, in this cartoon, as uh, anthropomorphic figures, where the legs represent the stall creep Region that projects the adhesin towards the extracellular environment because these proteins are cell surface uh, glycoproteins anchorated to the cell wall via a GPI anchor. So the legs are the stalk region that are sending, projecting the adhesin towards the extracellular environment. So then we have a torso which represents this tandem repeat region. And then finally, at the end terminus, we have the head of the adhesin, which is 
this Nigel-like region where the peptide binding cavity uh, lies. The, the place where the interaction between the cavity of the adhesive and the ligand on the cell target uh, occurs. So Candida albicans has eight members of this adhesin, and you see ALS3 is crowned here, has a, is the king, because in Candida albicans, this is the most important adhesin. Candida parapsilosis has only five members of ALS encoding gene, and in previous years, we have deleted them we have characterized them mainly through uh, a disruption uh, gene approach. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, uh, candida orthopsilosis, despite sharing very similar uh, properties in terms of adhesion, of adhesion and uh, pathogenicity, candida parapsilosis has only three members. So we decided to take a look at these three genes. And the first uh, when we started at first, um, this Arianna, excuse me. I, I don't know if you want it, but we can't see your presentation anymore. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Share a screen. I'll share it again. Uh, can you tell me where you lost me? Just the last slide. Okay, so I, I go mean, to the previous. We saw all the figures, the king, yeah, all, all that. Okay, so I was just saying that candida orthopsilosis has only three members okay. and we wanted to study these three ALS genes. And when we started, can you still see the slides? Yes, we can. Yeah, it's fine. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, they, were, uh, in, they were annotated in the genome, uh, the sequence strains, and they were on chromosome two and three. But two of them were annotated as incomplete orbs. So thanks to a collaboration with the University of Illinois and Lloyd Sawyer, we started a project where we um, generated a new reference genome assembly because we wanted to combine the nanopore technology, which provides you with long reads, with the Lumina data, which instead uh, gives you short reads. And the combination of what is required when you need to characterize genes which are um, characterized by a lot of repeated sequences. So thanks to this we were able to uh, predict the protein uh, structure and as you can see in this picture the ALS protein in candida autopsilosis uh, uh, turned out to be quite peculiar. They showed quite, a, quite a, um, a diverging features if we compare them with the candida they can say ALS, for example, they have a shortened and terminal domain, they have a shorter prion in each region. And then if you look at the bottom uh, bar that refers to the bigger gene, you see that there is a, a, a quite big tandem repeat region, which is unusually variable in size, which instead is completely absent from the other two genes. So we amplified this gene in a panel of six clinical isolates, and as you can see from PCR, they were uh, giving different bands, uh, showing a sign of allelic variability. With a PCR-driven approach, we wanted to see which locus was responsible for the variability. And uh, in agreement of what was found for Candida albicans, the carbosine terminal domain was the one, the legs, uh, remember, that project the uh, adhesin toward the uh, external part of the uh, environment, are the one contributing the most. And this is also valid for the longer gene, uh, ALS2220, but in this case also the tandem repeat uh, region plays a role. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see two bands uh, sometimes uh, because this shows you that there are the two alleles are confined for different uh, adhesin. But from a functional point of view, uh, really wanted to see whether they were behaving like adhesin, so we decided to use the uh, episomal strategy that Lisa Lombardi set up in Dublin, and I have to thank them, of course, for providing us with the plasmid. And we first, just to double check, used this system in Candida parapsilosis to inactivate the last two genes that were remaining uh, uncharacterized. And then we moved to the aim uh, of the study. Uh, and we wanted to, uh, in a single experiment, 
treatment in a single step uh, inactivate all of the three genes of the ALS family in candida orthopsilosis. But this system was never uh, tried in candida orthopsilosis before. So we wanted to validate the system and we picked the gene added to uh, as a first target because uh, this gene has a very easy to screen phenotype. As you can see here, it gives pink colonies. So we handpicked the colonies after the gene editing. And uh, as you can see in sequence on top, you have the wild type on in the bottom sequence, you have the new mutant. Other two new mutants uh, were, were bearing the correct mutation, the two stop codon and a restriction site. We also wanted to check whether the plasmid is easily lost from the edited strain, because you know, if Cas9 is still in the strain, even in an episomal form, it could lead to unwanted off targets. But to the second passage on YPD, which is a rich medium used for uh, fungal growth, you can see that uh, the plasmid is no longer there. You don't see any colonies in the place supplemented with the selection agent. So finally, we move to the inactivation of the gene family. In, and we use two genetic background, the sequence strains and a clinical isolate, which was previously characterized in our lab as highly adhesive. So we use the strategy that I told you before, and for the selection of the guide RNA, we were helped by the, by the MIT because uh, with Valmic via, via the MIT, we had a joint grant, uh, grant to work on this project, an MIT UNIP project. And they provided us with guide RNAs uh, directed towards the entire orpheum of Candida orthopsilosis. So we picked the best one that was targeting a conserved region at the prime end of the gene for the three ALS encoding genes. We co-transformed with the replaced plate that had codon stop, two stop codons, because one is okay, but two, we are really sure that the gene is going to be interrupted. And triple edited strains were successfully obtained in both genetic backgrounds. We validated them by allele specific PCR, restriction analysis, and of course, uh, sequencing. What was the resulting phenotype? First of all, the question was, uh, will they grow at the same extent as the wild time? The answer is yes. In the top graph, you can see a normal growth curve in the YPD medium, which is a rich medium. The four strain wild type versus the edited, the triple edited strains. <clears throat> And in the second and third figures, you see an analysis of microcalorimetry, which is in direct, indirect measurement of growth. And uh, the two curves, uh, the reference strains with the triple edited strains, gives a, a superimposable curves. The same applies for the clinical isolate. Are the triple edited strain impaired? If we think about it, we have take off three glycoproteins of the cell wall. So will this make them more susceptible to cell wall, cell wall perturbing agent? The answer is no. We didn't notice any major defect in the strains, in the triple edited strains. And what about morphogenesis? Uh, candida species are able to undergo morphogenesis by, and that means that they are able to grow as an yeast cell, but they are also able to form elongated cells that can have a form of, of a pseudo alpha. And this is the image that you see in this picture. You see elongated cells. And in some cases, this, this is not the case of candida orthopsilosis, but for instance, inst <coughs> instance sorry. Candida albicans can originate through IFE, which are much longer and uh, thinner. So what happens? From this picture, I would say that there is no impact on pseudo IFA formation because I see in all strains elongated form. But when I try to quantify them, I can see that triple edited strains somehow are impaired. They produce less elongated form. And this is important because elongated form morphogenesis is involved somehow in uh, in pathogenesis and virulence because they help the fungus to uh, migrate uh, and penetrate within the tissue. The last uh, assay that we performed was uh, a test on adhesion, and that was the, the, the moment of truth. So we used uh, to assess the adhesion um, a model of, uh, uh, that uses primary human buccal epithelial cells. And personally, I 
prefer primary cells in this case, uh, rather than cell culture, because although cell cultures are more reproducible, the human buccal epithelial cells are colonized by a, a flora, a bacterial flora, and this, this I think, uh, uh, better replicates what happens in nature, because adhesins, uh, fungal adhesins have been proven to, to bind not only to cellular ligands but also to bacterial cell wall elements. As you can see in this graph and also from the micrograph below, this graph uh, uh, reports an adhesion index. Uh, the data have been normalized uh, on the wild type strain. You can see that the triple edited strains have a, a dramatic degree uh, dramat dramat dramatic decrease uh, in the addition ability. It's almost abolished. So I think that uh, um, proves that the, L the ALS gene family also in candida autopsilosis plays an important role in the addition process. And I also think that the generation of this triple mutant could serve in the future as a genetic model if we want to try, for example, heterologous expression experiment to test maybe the function of other genes that might be potentially involved in the addition. So I want to conclude this first but by thanking the people that uh, have worked on this project, Daria Bottai, Maria Grazia Di, Lupo, uh, Di Luca. I want to thank especially Marina Zoppo, who is here, which is a former uh, PhD in my lab, who is now a very successful postdoc in Zurich, and all the students that have uh, contributed to this project, together with uh, Valmik Vias and Gerald Fing, who is now retired, and uh, at the MIT, Lois uh, Hoyer at the University of Illinois and uh, Lisa Lombardi and Geraldine Butler at the University College Dublin. Moving to the second part, in this case we are going to look at the CRISPR-Cas system in a different light, uh, but the selectivity and the specificity remains the key features of these uh, effector proteins. That makes them a very versatile biosensing element, so the aim is uh, to produce something that can implement the conventional uh, laboratory procedures because if we think of a portable point of care device this could be you know it could perform the identification test directly on site and providing a very rapid diagnostic approach. So if we take the blood sample from the patient we can think of uh, a point of care device which is uh, uh, built on paper, is arrayed, uh, it works on beads or on microfluidic channel and it's able to provide you with a result in a very short time so that the diagnose arrives quickly on site and potentially can influence the management of the patient with a personalized, a personalized therapy and this is particularly important for those patients who are experiences, experiencing a life-threatening condition like, for example, sepsis, where a timely diagnosis is really, it can really make a difference between life and death. When we think of uh, uh, setting up a system as a biosensor, we need to keep in the back of our mind the assured criteria. So, in theory, this system should be affordable, should be sensitive, specific, should be user-friendly so that uh, even not super skilled personnel uh, should be able to perform the test, should be rapid, reproducible, robust, should be equipment, equipment free if we want to make it portable and should be able to be de deliverable to them users. We all know that the gold standard of bloodstream diagnosis currently is Ending of uh, uh, blood culture positivization, and uh, this usually requires uh, about 20, 12 hours. After that, we have some confirmatory tests, either by gram staining or by performing auto uh, automated biochemical tests. And then, if we want to add on the antifungal susceptibility testing, we need to wait for a further for a further 18 to 24 hours. So, is a 
consuming procedures. On the other hand, there are other options, especially bigger laboratories that have a high throughput of samples that can have a multitude of instrument. So by mass spectrometry, they can, once they have a positivization of the culture, in few minutes obtain this. And the pros of the system obviously is that it's fast, reliable, is high throughput, the reagent usually are not that expensive. Uh, we can perform antimicrobial susceptibility testing, but one of the major limitations, and uh, there is a requirement for a current uh, uh, updating and of the database, because that uh, is really a crucial point uh, to provide a robust uh, diagnosis. And in addition, uh, you need an initial investment. Uh, the instrument is quite bulky, so it's quite difficult to make it portable. Time. Uh, in real time, uh, quantitative PCR, PCR approach of different nature are usually performed. They are already flanking the diagnostic routine. They are, they are highly specific and sensitive. They are easy if you have skilled personnel. Mm. On the other hand, they need pretreatment. Uh, there is a risk of contamination. There are false positive and false negative issues that need to be taken into account. Sensors are, uh, have attracted a lot of interest in the latest year, and uh, how do they work? Basically, we have an analyte that in our case uh, would be microbial DNA or RNA. You have a bioreceptor, which is the key features uh, which perform the biorecognition of the analyte. There can be an enzymes, a cell, an aptamer, DNA, nanoparticles. And upon biorecognition, a signal is generated. It can be light, heat, uh, pH change and then is transduced, trans, transduced. At the end, it has to be converted in a signal that can be visualized on the display. So the biosensor should have selectivity as a first step, but also sensitivity, reproducibility, and stability over time. Why? Why thinking at the CRISPR-Cas system? Because Cas enzymes are highly specific. There are several types of uh, CAS effectors and uh, according to the latest uh, classification, one of the uh, recent, most recent classification, they are divided into classes, class 1 and class 2. I'm going to focus uh, mainly on type 2 effector, meaning CAS9, and I'm going to talk about type 5 and 6, CAS12 and CAS13, and then I'm going to focus my attention on CAS12. But you can see that there are several types and, and subtypes involved in different functions. The first biosensor that were published and they were set up, uh, they all exploited type 2 CAS effectors, namely CAS9. You see, between 2016 and 2020, so was either CAS9 or deactivated CAS9 that is used basically as a, a biorecognition element because it's been uh, 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 deprived from the um, activity of uh, uh, cutting the double strand break, uh, performing the double strand break. But when class five and six were discovered, they attracted much more attention than class nine because these uh, enzymes are also equipped with a collateral activity, which is really, really interesting. In 2017, Zank worker discovered the class 13 collateral activity and based on this enzyme, they developed the so-called Sherlock biosensor, which is the acronym for Highly Sensitive Enzymatic Reporter Unlocking System, and is represented in the, in the top part of the slide. So you see the target, RNA, DNA, then you he here have a, a recombinase polymerase amplification, which is an isothermal amplification that provides uh, the RNA, the, the CRISPR, the, the target, which is recognized by CAS13 together with the CRISPR RNA. And once this first recognizement, this step is performed, the collateral activity is triggered. And the collateral activity basically simply breaks down the reporter. So releases the signal which is then available. In a similar manner, the second big biosensor milestone 
uh, based this time on CAS-12, which was discovered by the Duna group in 2018, um, allowed the uh, setup of the detector biosensor. Again, this is the chronomos, and as you can see, the versatility is not only viral or bacterial infection, but the system that's wo that is working pretty much in the same way can also be applied to cancer screening, SNP detection, and so on. Both, both sensors were published uh, in science. In this table, I have quickly summarized the main difference between these two CAS effectors, CAS9 versus CAS12 in particular, because CAS12 is the enzymes we have uh, been focused on in our, in our project. The most important things uh, require, uh, is uh, connected to the collateral activity, which is present in CAS12, but uh, as you see, as you can see, is absent from CAS9. And then there are several other peculiar characteristics, different palm sequencing, different uh, staggered ends versus blunt ends, and so on. So since uh, these new effectors were out, uh, the number of port portable biosensing produced uh, is exponentially growing. You see, if you look at PubMed, there are every year several biosensor produced. What makes the difference can also be the transduction method that is uh, selected, optical versus electrochemical. Most of the biosensors published so far are based on an optical method of uh, transduction. And the system is pretty simple. You can see it here. So you have uh, the reporter, which is a fluorophore, which is connected to a quencher by a single strand DNA. When CAS12 recognizes its target thanks to the guide or name just associated, CAS12 is activated and this triggers the collateral activity. So the collateral activity, which is specifically directed towards single strand DNA, basically breaks down this report and frees this and releases the signal. The pros of this kind of system is that they are sensitive, they are partially quantitative, and that uh, there is a lot of of literature you can look at because uh, the majority of uh, biosensors are made, uh, are built this way, as I said. The cons, on the other hand, you need to have a fluorimeter with you for the readout. Electrochemical biosensor instead are very poorly, uh, very poorly characterized. There are very, very few li literature available and no sensor was developed until now to reveal bacterial or viral DNA. They are sensitive, they are quantitative, they are portable. So is, here you can see there's no requirement for any label because basically it's just upon activation, the collateral activity that cuts this uh, single strand of DNA which are on the surface of the sensor and this changes from the electrochemical point of view the surface uh, itself. So to summarize uh, what I've told you uh, until now, here is the base of this biosensor. So at the heart we have the CRISPR-Cas system as biosensing element. It can be type 2 like Cas9 or DCAS9 or it can be a type 5 or type 6, so Cas12 or Cas13. Here we have the analyte, the microbial, uh, the microbial DNA or RNA in our case, and then the transduction. So I want to finish off this talk by um, presenting you the project that I have embarked on in the last couple of years, thanks to uh, Fabio Di Francesco, who is a colleague at the, the Department of Chemistry and uh, Industrial Chemistry of the University of Pisa, who have persuaded me that we could join our expertise in molecular biology and uh, in chemistry to develop uh, <clears throat> a label-free biosensing assay for the detection of bacterial DNA, exploiting the CRISPR-Cas12 system, coupled with electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Uh, and this is, was a quite an impervious uh, journey because there was nothing published on this uh, and uh, it wasn't easy to um, collect all the information. So first we wanted to verify in vitro if this system was feasible. So if we 
we could uh, by using a laboratory strain and a clinical isolated bacterial strain validate uh, at least as a proof of concept the system in vitro to move uh, then to develop a uh, first uh, pilot uh, sensor for further testing so we selected uh, E. coli and Staphylococcus uh, uh, because these are two microorganisms that are commonly associated with sepsis we started uh, off with the reference uh, strains uh, for both pathogens. We designed, we, we picked up two genes uh, that are usually, um, that are commonly used for uh, molecular identification, which are NUC genes for Staphylococcus and MDH for E. coli. We designed the guide RNA, verified them with online tools. And then we started to the first, we moved to the first set of experiment. So if uh, the DNA of E. coli or Staphylococcus is amplified, so we selected a fragment of about uh, 900 base pair, and if the CRISPR RNA is present, then Cas12 should be perform a simple cut, dividing the fragment into visible uh, bands. So in the, in the first attempt, uh, we let the complex to be formed between Cas12 Cas12 and the CRISPR RNA for 50 minutes, then we incubate for 30 minutes with the target, and then we run our own electrophoresis. As this is as just a, a representative gel. I wanted to show you just two lanes as an example. For example, here in lane two, we have the Cas12 enzyme, we have the CRISPR RNA, we should recognize E. coli amplicon, and we have the correct E. coli target, the PCR product. And as you can see, the two respective band are produced. Vice versa, in lane 3, we have Cas12, the CRISPR RNA for E. coli, but we have the Staph aureus target amplicon, as a, and as a result, Cas12 doesn't cut the fragment. And this goes on in the rest of the gel, so we tried all the different combinations, and we could verify that Cas12 was able to cleave the target only when the specific CRISPR RNA was present, even if it was in a mixed sample, so the selectivity was checked. The second step was, was to prove the collateral activity. So once the recognizement has occurred, once the first cut by Cas12 has been performed on the specific target, then the collateral activity should be triggered, and the collateral activity is directed towards a single-strand DNA. To do so, we, we tested the ability of the amplicons to trigger this collateral activity and we use a single strand DNA reporter. We selected two kinds of single strand reporter. One was 100 base pair, 100 base long and the other was 50 and we tested both at, at room temperature at, uh, and uh, at 37 degrees. So here see the same step, CRISPR cast um, complexes are formed, 15 minutes, that for the incubation for 30 minutes. And then in this case, having such small fragment, we use uh, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Uh, bear with me and uh, let's have a look uh, to begin with, with line eight and nine. In these two lanes, uh, we have just the single strand DNA probe. So you see two bands at 100 base pair. And in lane six and seven, you see only the probe, single strand DNA probe, this time 50 nucleotide long, okay? If we look instead at lanes 2, 3, 4 and 5, the difference is that we have added the CRISPR-Cas complexes with the template. And as you can see in the corresponding green or yellow box, the band is disappeared. And this points into the uh, direction of a collateral uh, collateral activity and have been uh, obtained. We wanted to see whether the system could, in theory, work all, also on clinical isolate. We selected 10 clinical isolate for Staphylococcus, 10 for E. coli, coming from different regions of the world, different, different uh, uh, isolation sites. We sequenced the PCR fragment, and here you see just the representative gels for three of them. 
one and uh, I'm not going to go into the detail but all the expected bands were obtained even when in the sequence of the amplicon uh, we could observe some single nucleotide polymorphisms so in theory this is quite encouraging this is promising if you think of implementing the system for a clinical microbiological application. So the first part was, uh, uh, was verified. In theory, the system is feasible. Now we want to develop our system, our sensor. So um, the general idea is that if you can modify the, surfer, the surface of the sensor by positioning the single strand probes, and you have your enzyme, the Cas12 uh, complexes with the CRISPR RNA for a given pathogen, and nothing happens because the, the target is not there, the sensor surface doesn't change. And as a result, so with an electrochemical uh, method, such as the electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, in, you don't see any change between before and after. If instead the enzymes is in the presence of the target, the situation changes because the collateral activity is triggered and the single strand DNA on the surface of the sensor is degraded. And in this case, you should see a difference in, in the signal, in the ACE signal that you obtain, demonstrating the presence of a specific target. So, Although that was not in line with the assured criteria that I mentioned before, because uh, uh, we use a gold electrode that certainly is not affordable, uh, but to begin with, uh, we had this available in the lab and we started with the gold surface, also because the gold surface uh, reacts with a sulfur atom which is present on the strand of our DNA probe. So thanks to this, it was possible in the presence of mercaptoethanol to assemble a mono, a mono layer that was uh, ordinated on the surface of the cells. The sensor preparation was, the functionalization was evaluated Weighted both with sigil voltammetry and uh, with ACE, and I hope you won't ask me much about the um, um, much detail about this technique because I'm not very familiar with it. Uh, that was performed at the Department of Biochemistry, but what I understood that uh, by interpreting the results they obtained is that uh, DNA was successfully immobilized on the surface of the electrode. We also wanted to quantify the DNA molecules present on the sensor by chronoculometry because this could be important if we want to uh, obtain a quantification of the signal. And uh, even in this case, by knowing the length of the DNA molecule that we are spotting on the surface and the area of the electrode, a quantification of DNA was possible. And on three sensors that were functionalized, the average of molecules that we obtained was uh, in, a co in agreement to what was in the literature, so we had uh, about five times 10 to the 10th uh, molecules per square centimeters. So here we go. Will it work? Uh, we weren't sure, so the first step we wanted to try with the, an, a specific endonuclease. We use DNAs, a normal DNAs that we have in the lab, and we wanted to see that if in the presence of DNAs something was happening on the surface of the sensor where we had spotted our uh, single strand probes and if the surface was changing we should have seen a decrease in the signal and as you can see from the graph uh, of the electrochemical impedance spectroscopy we have a 38 percent decrease in this RCT signal which stands for change transfer resistance. I, For me it's easier to understand this in the graph below where you see this change after 45 minutes uh, uh, DNA treatment. Whereas if you perform the second DNA uh, treatment, a further 45 minutes with the DNA does not change significantly the situation. So 45 minutes with the DNA are more than enough. And now we arrive at the 
a proof of concept. So this time we tested the sensor with the CRISPR-Cas complex in the presence of the amplified target. And we use, in this picture, I'm showing you the results uh, that we obtained with uh, E. coli. And uh, the answer is yes. Uh, when Cas12 recognizes its target and uh, uh, performs its first double strain break, then he activates the collateral activity that uh, dramatically changes the surface electrode with over a 51% uh, variation in the RCT uh, value. Cas12 alone instead does not change uh, the surface of the electrode nor the net, the net buffer. So one of the major issues of this uh, is uh, because uh, the, the, this is the, the core of the problem. We want the system to be sensitive. Literature reports that the amount of bacterial DNA in blood that during a blood stream infraction is around 10 to the third, 10 to the four genome copies per mm. We tested in vitro uh, a concentration of three nanomolar, uh, nanomolar amplified amplicon. And these uh, more or less correspond to 10 to the 10th copy of the gene. So if we think of starting from a bloodstream sample and we perform a 20 cycle PCR amplification, we reach approximately a number of gene copy, which is equal to 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10th, the which uh, put us exactly at the borderline of the detection ability. So this is uh, an issue which is very important at that we need to significantly improve in the future. Uh, so to conclude, um, for concluding remarks, I can say the, that uh, the Cas12 uh, CRISPR RNA system was implemented uh, with the, one of the first uh, um, label-free single-strand coated electrode with an uh, electrode chemical impedance spectroscopy uh, biosensing uh, transduction method. The threshold was three nanomolar for both E. coli and staph aureus, so this is something we need to work on. Another challenge that we are facing is to reduce the overall turnaround time because we need to be competitive. Uh, we say that the Malditov uh, is about an hour from start to end. So this obstacle could be overcome if we could implement uh, the ACE biosensing assay in a portable isothermal amplification device. Um, the isothermal amplification device uh, could uh, bring uh, to 10 minutes uh, the amplification step, bringing the overall procedures under an hour. The next step uh, will be, we need to be affordable. So no more gold, we need to move to a new biosensor prototype, where nanoelectrodes will be printed on an hybrid plastic paper substrate. And this subst paper, plastic paper substrate will be integrated in portable devices, such as a smartphone. At this point, uh, it will really be portable. And we are doing that in collaboration with Professor Arban Mercoci at the Nanobioelectronics and Biosensor at the University of Barcelona. So I want to finish off this time for good by thanking Fabio Di Francesco at the Department of Chemistry who inspired the whole project. Uh, it took a while to persuade me. At the beginning I was recalcitrant. I didn't understand much. I didn't understand much of the their electrochemical device, but in the end I'm very glad that uh, I have uh, accepted to embark on the project at the Department of Biology. Daria Bottai and Maria Grazia Di Luca are working on this uh, on this project. And we have uh, joined the PhD students, uh, Noemi and Andrea. Andrea Bonini at the moment is uh, uh, in Barcelona at the uh, Professor Mercoci lab, uh, trying to print these uh, small electrodes and integrate them into a smartphone. And with this, I think I'm finished. And uh, I thank you once again for your attention. And I'll be happy to take uh, any questions.